If you're looking to invest in an investment trust, there's a couple of pretty obvious things you can do. Get a view of how good the fund manager is, look at their long-term track record. But should you also take a view on who your fellow travellers in the portfolio are going to be, your shareholders? Well, to discuss why that's so important, I'm joined now by Piers Curry. He's director of a city consultancy called Warhorse Partners, and he's been working in the investment trust industry for over 30 years. Piers, thank you for joining us. Um, just to start with, can you tell us why the composition of the shareholder base is so important if you're considering investing in investment trust? Good question, Mark. I think um, this looks at one of the fundamental differences between an open-ended fund and a listed investment trust company. And some people are aware that one of the benefits of an investment trust company is that the share price uh, operates independently to the underlying net asset value. This can be useful in a downturn uh, where liquidity issues can affect open-ended. But what it really means um, with an investment trust company you have two audiences that matter. You have the, the oh, and two underlying assets, uh, which is the NAV, but also the share price. And the share price is determined by the behavior of people buying and selling shares. So the ownership structure can determine what the returns are to shareholders independent of the underlying net asset value. So is this just a case that if you've got more shareholders that want to get out of the trust than want to buy it, it the, the um, supply outstrips demand so the share price falls? Or is there something a little more profound than that going on, depending on the type of shareholder that's in there? Yes, good, good question. Historically, um, the investment trust sector attracted a whole range of different types of audiences from big institutions, which would be county council pension funds, um, corporate pension funds, insurance companies. And they used to be what was known as the anchor tenants of the, uh, of the investment marketplace. And over the last 20 years, this, this group has evolved away into having its assets managed in a different format. So if you've got a changing structure uh, that is not actually um, uh, balanced, so some uh, uh, what they call stock overhang might be that someone wants to leave the company, uh, but like, uh, is it like the Rocky Horror Show, you, it's easier to get in than to leave, uh, you'll have a, a depression of the share price because the evaluation on the stock exchange, will, the, the investors will know that there's a big investor who wants to go out, which can depress pricing. And pricing is what people own, the actual share price. So it does have a material effect. If the, if the shareholder balance uh, is not balanced in the, in the sense of, of a willing constituency, um, you may have dysfunction when it comes to pricing. But are there any specific trends that you're seeing in the industry right now? And why are they significant? Yes, there are significant trends. And I think the largest, and they're parallel, one is that the, the big institutions of old are leaving the sector. Um, the, the largest growth area um, is perhaps not unsurprisingly, what's known as the direct to consumer channel, that's self-directed investors was massive. In 2019, in our report we did two weeks ago, we looked at all the data and found that actually something like 6.7 billion of 110 billion in the sector was money coming in, cash flow, from self-directed private investors who are actually compensating massively for the outgoing institutional investors on a factor of three or four times. So what we're seeing is a change of the ownership to individuals from something that used to be more institutionally owned. And that means communication has to be adapted to try to cover that audience in a different way to the professional audiences of the times past. Well, you talked about the need to have a, a balanced shareholder base. In the round, do you think the investment trust industry has got a balanced shareholder debt base today? I think a lot of them certainly do. And actually, one way to sort of have a quick benchmark to look at that is, is that the larger uh, platform providers, Hargreaves or, or, or uh, Interactive Investor Trustnet, tend to publish what are the most favoured uh, retail-owned investment trusts. And often they've been doing their communication to uh, end investors for some decades, um, where you may find there is a, a more imbalanced shareholder base, might be newer trusts that, that were launched with one or two large institutional shareholders. But the general move is that the older the trusts are, uh, the, the more likely it is that they've got a big, broad canvas of uh, uh, shareholders, which will mean that the demand is very regular and very safe. 
We've seen a big rise in the number of direct investors buying investment trusts in the last few years, particularly via the likes of sort of Hargreaves Lansdowne, AJ Bell, Interactive Investor. Is there a danger that they're being disenfranchised? Do they have this? Do they have the, the knowledge of what their shareholder rights are? Is there a danger they get swamped by larger institutional investors by these sort of big block votes when it comes to key decisions? I think the whole issue of shareholder democracy, because these are shares, and likewise, if you are a holder of a share in, in, in BP or BT or any public uh, company, um, the individual shareholders, of course, its voting rights aren't, aren't necessarily massive uh, because you're one person. And if you're an institution, you might own hundreds of thousands of shares. So there is a distortion in, in the sense that the larger shareholder blocks are able to have more voting power. The second issue is, to some extent, the interest that the end investor really has on, on lots and lots of minority voting issues. Sometimes these are very statutory, um, um, approving the accounts, uh, approving the directors, which are fine, uh, but they've got a, uh, most people have got a busy life and they don't necessarily want to be doing it. I think where it becomes significant, perhaps, is when there's a corporate action or something quite chunky and decisive has to be orchestrated. But I think the calculation is something like less than 0.25% of end investors, retail investors, actually wish to vote anyway. Some platforms allow them the right to do it, which is uh, splendid. But the, um, I, I think the imbalance might be that the larger the, larger the institutional holder is, the more, the more weights they can carry, and they generally do tend to vote. Hmm. And finally, what can the Board of Investment Trust do to make sure that the portfolio has got a real purpose, a real mission that can deliver for investors rather than just being, you know, a me too product? Well, I think like, I think what investment trusts are, are moving to now is increasing a more uh, consumer type world where sensitivity to what the needs and expectations are of end investors is becoming very significant. And what we're seeing now with what the government calls the democratization of risk, but it really means we've all got to make provisions for our retirement assets and wealth. The type of way that people are buying investments is no longer solely through being part of a big institutional life fund or a wealth manager's portfolio. The self-directed investor is, is um, doing a lot more of the, uh, DIY. And as, as a result, they have to... Um, you know, make sure that they're informed of uh, in their due diligence that they are investing in the right area. One hopes that the, that the most boards will be sensitive to what is the purpose of the vehicle. Um, and the purpose sometimes for um, end investors is about their retirement wealth, a, a solution um, uh, uh, for what they're trying to uh, go for, which is, can be different to being a component in a broader portfolio uh, than perhaps it might have been historically. So relevance is something which is a, a board concern is our trust performing a relevant duty to what the modern uh, uh, growing, particularly D2C channel, is expecting from them. So final question, what would your tips be for an end investor who's trying to work out the difference between a trust where it's got some lovely marketing around it and it all sounds great, and whether it genuinely has a sense of purpose and it's a vehicle that suits them? Well, the obvious shorthand would be, and in, and in more consumer markets, you'd sort of know what, what the slogan stands for. So um, we knew what Avis meant. Avis, you know, we try harder. We, I think a lot of the language around investment trust communications needs to recognize that people are short of time and they only really want to have a very quick way to appreciate the differentiation on what could look like a vast commodity range of, of different uh, 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 companies and doing uh, very similar things. So I, I, I think whilst I love investment objectives, most of them sound the same, growth of income and capital. So if the investor's on his own or her own, um, I think there's a wonderful opportunity to actually them to try and build a dashboard to double check, is this vehicle doing what I think it is? And the AIC has a really good website. You can check uh, that against the sector. Is this a big or a small vehicle? Is it performing well? That's marvelous. Um, even uh, for dedicated hobbyists, you can go to the London Stock Exchange site. It will tell you who are the top 10 holders uh, of, of that vehicle. And if it looks like there's too much concentration of power into one 
uh, single shareholder hand, that may raise a flag, but it means that there are tools, Trustnet, AIC, Morningstar, that, that would be available when people are making their own due diligence to say, is this animal behaving as I want it to be, and do I understand it easily and quickly enough? Um, so I, I have no magic spells, but I think it's important to look at ownership as well as looking at uh, returns and what the claim is uh, on an investment objective. We have to leave it there. Piers Curry, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.